Hey yo, welcome back to my channel. So when it comes to the science aspects on where life came from, we still have a lot of unsolved mysteries. Some things like the Big Bang or evolution are pretty well solidified with mountains upon mountains of evidence behind it, but something we talk a little less about is abiogenesis. Now that's not to say we don't have evidence for it, we do, and we have a lot of the processes mapped out already, but evidence for it is difficult to gather and doesn't overlap too much with other fields of science like evolution does. So today I figured it'd be a good idea to talk about this a little more, specifically regarding a particular cellular their structure. Charles Darwin and some modern scientists think that life started all on its own. It sort of just happened spontaneously. It's called chemical evolution. Charles Darwin actually tried his best to avoid talking about the origin of the very first life form. His main focus was, as you know, the evolution of species and how they changed over time. But of course that doesn't mean he didn't have an opinion on it, which given his lack of mentioning, I can only assume he doesn't strongly believe it. Anyway, I've never heard of chemical evolution before. This sounds like another made up term that doesn't actually reflect the thought processes of actual scientists and its main purpose is to lump it together along with the theory of evolution. There's a term called abiogenesis, which means the origin of life from inanimate material by itself, hence the A in the word. I've talked a lot about abiogenesis in my previous video, so I won't go into too much detail now, but instead it seems like we're going to focus on a particular aspect of abiogenesis. Just like eggs have a hard time turning into a chicken without a shell, and water balloons are not much fun without the balloon, Living things need a cozy little house of their own to keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. We're talking cell membranes. All living things are made up of cells that are surrounded by a cell membrane. Life simply cannot exist without membranes. Cell membranes are indeed very important since they act not only as a container for organelles, but also control what goes in and out of the cell. In addition to providing the cell what it needs, you can also think of the membrane as a security system. And we all need a sense of security in our everyday lives just to function, from the house that you live in to the passwords you use for your social media platforms. Huh? What's that? That doesn't apply to you because you use the same password for everything? Oh, no, 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 that can't do. But luckily, I have the perfect solution for you. Introducing NordPass, your all-around password manager and cybersecurity friend we all need but don't have. Credentials compromisation is the leading cause of hacking activity, accounting for more than 60% of breaches. And if you have a password you use for everything, like I did, then being hacked once means you get hacked on every account you own. And despite all the warnings you get from everything cybersecurity telling you to use different passwords and to create a unique long password that encompasses numbers, capital letters, symbols, and your firstborn, it's no wonder people ignore that advice. No normal person can remember 10 different passwords that's a combination of random characters. And if you write them down, then there's really no point to it which is why NordPass is a perfect solution. It's quick to set up, easy to use, and manages all your passwords across all websites and online platforms. For those unfamiliar with how this works, you get one master password that gives you access to manage all your other passwords. NordPass will then memorize all those individual passwords and auto-log you into each platform whenever you visit them. No one but you can see the passwords, not even the Nord team themselves. I know there's a lot of you out there that uses your own names in your password. You're literally asking to be hacked. So to not only increase your security, but also make your life significantly easier, you can head over to nordpass.com stick to take advantage of this service, or use the code stick on checkout. With this code, you will get access to a sale happening right now, which gives you 70% off a two-year plan, about $1.43 per month, and you get a month for free. It's literally a steal. Once again, that's nordpass.com stick. Thank you to NordPass for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's continue on and learn about the container and security systems of the first life forms on Earth. Origin of Life researchers claim that cell membranes are easy to make and that they have demonstrated this in the lab. They point toward experiments where these molecules called phospholipids are placed in water and they form into a spherical shell, kind of like a cell membrane, all on their own. Wow. Yes, it seems ridiculous upon first glance, until you learn that the laws of entropy allow for such a thing to happen. In case you forgot everything you learned in your high school biology classes, phospholipids have a hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic head. The inside of the membrane is where the hydrophobic tails aggregate. Anyway, nonpolar molecules don't actually stick together, but rather they tend to aggregate together because that increases the overall entropy of the enclosed system. And you know, entropy always increases over time. That being said, it doesn't necessarily have to become a phospholipid, but that is indeed one of the stable formations that can result from molecules with a polar and nonpolar end. You're probably used to seeing single layer lipid spheres or micelles, which under normal circumstances is usually what they become. The hydrophobic ends on the inside and the hydrophilic ends interact with the solvent on the outside, usually water. This is a stable formation that maximizes entropy. Your soap actually works like this. It's a series of molecules with hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. Things like grease or oil are hydrophobic, which is why you can't really wash them off with water by itself. Soap molecules encompasses the grease particles within the micelle structure, so the fatty part sits inside. Meanwhile, 
the hydrophilic heads can then bond with water. This process essentially just transforms the hydrophobic molecule into a hydrophilic one, which then allows the oil or grease to dissolve into the water, making it easy to wash off. Oh, Professor Stick, I hear you ask. Then how does it get into the bilayer formation? Very good question. Although that is definitely harder, it's also a stable structure. Think of it this way. Instead of a grease or oil molecule being inside the micelle, what if it's just another phospholipid? If you have just phospholipids by itself in water, then this bilayer forms very, very naturally. Now that being said, it's obviously not as easy as that. Where do the phospholipids originally come from? Did early organisms even have bilayers, or did they have something simpler? These are all questions we are currently investigating. Membranes do a lot of essential things to keep the cell alive. If any are missing, death results. <gasps> But here's the thing, we tend to always compare early life to life that are currently on the planet. Other than taking away some basic principles, such as the requirement of an information medium, we need to be careful about what we assume. For example, he's assuming that early life forms would need a complex membrane to function or even a membrane at all. But when we're talking about life, which doesn't have a strict definition to it, it can be tricky in defining exactly where the border is between non-life and life. And as a result, that would affect everything we think of as a requirement of life. It's important to tread carefully. But walls that are sealed up tight, with no way to let trash out or new food in, will quickly become a stinky tomb. The cell will quickly die as food runs out and garbage piles up. The very simple membranes that scientists create in the lab are exactly like this. Okay, so I cut out a little bit here, but he's saying that the membranes created in scientific laboratories do not let items in and out of the cell, which is something important for the cell to survive. And that is very, very true. Substances have to be maintained very precisely in order for proper cell function. For example, neurons require a very careful control of internal vs external charges in order to fire signals, and this is done through the regulation of charged ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. But this claim that the cell membranes created in a laboratory is not allowing things to enter or leave is actually quite dishonest because all lipid bilayers, no matter the exact molecular composition, will be semi-permeable to some degree. Hydrophobic molecules, for example, can generally pass through because of the hydrophobic insides of the bilayer. Uncharged molecules, especially smaller ones, also can. Size matters here, and the smaller the better. So much so that even water being hydrophilic can pass through the hydrophobic insides of the phospholipid bilayer to some degree due to the small size. Anything else, such as charged molecules, will indeed have trouble, which is why modern cells have protein channels that either allow for for passive transport by creating a hydrophilic bridge of some sort within the hydrophobic zones, or by active transport, using energy to transport. Or even for larger things, we can use the membrane itself as a transportation vehicle. No matter what it is, the possibilities of creating such systems on early Earth is not particularly meaningful if we don't first sort out the requirements of the cell. Because early cells are much, much simpler, requiring less resources, and can operate under minimalistic structures. I'm going to keep hammering this point because it's important to know that we cannot be comparing living organisms today with living organisms billions of years ago. Creating the phospholipid bilayer in a lab is a proof of concept, not that this is actually what happened during the origin of life. And there is room for modification depending on what the first life required. What if early membranes were a bit leaky, like these papers suggest? Maybe the first cells had holes in them that were just big enough to let good things in and keep the bad stuff out, somehow finding a good balance to maintain homeostasis. Unfortunately, that won't work. All existing cell membranes need to let big things in, while at the same time keeping small things out. In other words, they have conflicting requirements. But that's not actually what a leaky membrane means. Let's take a look at one of the papers, for example, where the quote, leaky part refers to proton permeability, which can be taken advantage of for the sake of energy production and metabolism. Considering the environment that the ancestor of archaea and bacteria lived in, which by the way is the original motivation of this paper, a sodium proton antiporter could have been present and been the inception of membrane evolution involving ion regulation. The leaky part just refers to protons, which you seem to understand, but you can't, in a general sense, classify things big and small into good and bad. It depends entirely on what the particles can be used for, which is dependent on that evolutionary process to begin with, and with the first life forms, that simply has not yet been defined. This is yet another case of comparing to modern organisms. In addition, the paper is talking about the most recent common ancestor between archaea and bacteria, which isn't considered the first life form. So even this is too complex already, it implies that life forms before that was not dependent on proton gradients. All cells harness their energy by pumping protons out and very carefully letting them back in to spin these proton turbines like a hydroelectric power plant. And protons are teensy tiny. 
Once again, you're making assumptions. Organisms today use the electron transport chain. There is some evidence that some early organisms potentially used a charged gradient system to generate energy, and it likely goes back further than we think. But that doesn't necessarily mean the first organisms did. The first organisms used chemical energy, likely derived from something like carbon and hydrogen, and from other processes not dependent on proton gradients. Another conflicting requirement is that cells have to let water in. But if water was just allowed to pour in willy-nilly, so would those sneaky tiny little protons, and this would drain the cell's battery, so to speak, and the cell would, again, die. Thankfully, cells have specialized doors called aquaporins. They work sort of like an airlock in our space house by safely letting things in without destroying the nice environment inside. Aquaporins aren't there because they want to let only water in without charged ions or protons. The bite layer itself already acts as that barrier. Water can already pass through, but ions can't due to the hydrophobic nature of the phospholipid bite layer. But because the inside of the membrane is nonpolar, water can't pass through that quickly, which is why aquaporins are important since they facilitate faster water diffusion. It would be nice if you could correct some of the basic biological concepts in your video because it is a Bit misleading. Anyway, that's my time today. Thank you all again for watching. I hope you learned something new today, and I would like to especially thank my patrons Fireshard, Alan Morton, Miss Fixit, and Edward Martin for their continuous support. I will see you next time.